All right. Um, well, thank you so much, Cedric, for coming to speak to us today. I'm just going to um, introduce you by reading out your bio and then we'll get going. So Cedric Fermat is a composer, musician, mastering engineer, author, independent researcher, concert organizer, and curator who, operate, who operates in the field of electroacoustic, noise, electronic, experimental, and improvised music since 1989. Born in Zaire, Democratic Republic of Congo, he mostly grew up in Belgium and currently lives in Germany, in Berlin, I believe. Um, through his label and platform, Surf, Cedric publishes and promotes electronic, experimental and noise music from Asia and Africa and, at a lower extent, Latin America. Um, his writings focus on music from Asia and or Africa, sound art in East and Southeast Asia, um, historical and political considerations with Dimitri de la Faila. Um, power through networking, reshaping the underground electronic and experimental music scenes in East and Southeast Asia, um, an introduction to electroacoustic, noise and experimental music in Asia and Africa, and Not Your World Music, Noise in Southeast Asia, a book written and edited together with Dimitri de la Faila, um, 2016, which won the Golden Nika um, prize in the arts electronica and the digital music and sound art category um, in 2016. Cedric has performed and collaborated with artists across Europe, Africa, Asia, Middle East and um, Africa. Oh, Africa twice. Um, he also performs in several projects such as Axioma, um, Tasjil Mujahed, Marie Takahashi and Cedric Fama, amongst others. Um, so that was the short version of your bio, Cedric, because you've just done so much and it's incredible. And I've been following your work for a few years now, and I'm just so excited to hear um, what you have to talk about from your very rich and kind of wide-reaching practice. So, yeah, I'll pass over to you now. Thanks very much. Thank you, Annie. Um, and hello, everyone. Um, so, yeah, you've heard the biography now. Uh, I'm going to um, clarify a few uh, things about me. Um, um, so I find it a pretty important uh, in my bio <laughs> to mention that I was born in Zaire, uh, so the uh, current uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo, um, because of uh, what I'm writing about, and I will explain a bit later why it is so important for me. Um, so, um, I will start with uh, how I started, in fact, as a um, teenager, and what led me to what I'm doing now as a composer and musician, also as a, um, an independent researcher. Um, so I grew up in Belgium and uh, I realized when I was a teenager that I was one of the very few uh, kids, uh, brown kids uh, in this field of uh, industrial music, experimental music and punk music and so on and so forth. And I wondered uh, why, because I had friends who were also uh, foreigners from um, Turkey, North Africa, and other parts of the world, uh, but mostly not interested in uh, this kind of music. Um, and uh, well, I couldn't really not understand why they were not interested in this field and why it was so uh, wide, so to speak, this, these uh, scenes with an S and not only one scene. And uh, in the uh, so I started to, to, to listen to so-called alternative electronic music in 1986. I was 14 years old back then. And um, in 1989, I started my first band. Um, I was still in Belgium back then. And uh, two years later, I started a label, a tape label. It was uh, uh, working like this back then. You had no money and... Uh, uh, you would uh, um, do everything by, by yourself and there was no internet uh, but there was this uh, wonderful tape network and uh, mail art 
also uh, network and we could trade and, and buy and, and sell uh, cassettes or vinyls and so on. Um, so I started to get more and more of this uh, so-called experimental music and electroacoustic and so on, even though I didn't know what electroacoustic music was back then. And um, I thought, why am I getting um, music from mostly Western Europe and especially <laughs> North West <laughs> of Europe and uh, North America and, and, and hardly anywhere else, like a, a bit of Japan, a bit of uh, Australia, but I could not get anything from Africa, from Latin America, from, from Asia and uh, even from Eastern Europe was very difficult with a few exceptions like Yugoslavia was, was a big exception. Um, I had a tiny, tiny bit Czechoslovakia and Poland, but even though it was very difficult, especially without the internet. And I thought uh, that can't be true. There must be people almost everywhere who, who are interested in this music and who compose this kind of music as well. Um, so I started to make some flyers um, that I put in envelopes with some tapes I was shipping with people who was trading music. And uh, on the flyer I would write that I was looking for people in uh, whatever country, from Asia, from Africa and so on, or all over the world, uh, who would be interested to participate in, uh, in these compilations I was setting up. It would take uh, ages, a little month, of course, to sometimes get an answer. Uh, like somebody would tell me, hey, I know somebody in South Africa, for example. I know somebody in Brazil. And write, I would write the person and um, hoping to, to get an answer. Or somebody would give me the, the contact of somebody in the Philippines. And sometimes I would not get any answer. And sometimes I would get an answer. Um, but as soon as I started to get some replies from uh, first people from Brazil, from uh, South Africa, from Chile as well, Japan, I thought, okay, um, there are definitely people outside of Western Europe who are interested in this kind of music and who do this kind of music. Uh, the problem is uh, reaching them. Um, so I published a few uh, compilations and uh, I would say that one uh, of my achievements uh, back then, according to my standards, uh, was a cassette um, called, um, in French, Archives Humaines, Volume 1, uh, uh, so um, uh, Human Archives, uh, Volume 1. Uh, I wanted to have a kind of global um, alternative electronic uh, improvised music and uh, so-called experimental music and noise music uh, compilation. Uh, not really global in the end when we see what we can do now regarding global projects, but back then it was uh, very difficult. So I managed to, to, to get um, 25 artists and bands from 25 countries, again, mostly from, from Europe. Uh, so I took um, um, whatever I could find in, in Eastern and Western Europe, uh, but also, uh, like I mentioned, Brazil and Japan and South Africa. Um, I, I was very happy uh, with this project, but there was not enough uh, for me. And I could still not understand why I could not find uh, more, um, especially for, for Asia and Africa. With, with Latin America, it was, it was a bit different. It was mostly a problem of uh, getting the contacts because I had these contacts in Chile and uh, Brazil uh, but I knew there were people in Argentina or Mexico. Um, but sometimes you would just you would just write and not get any answer. Um, but then, and in uh, the early two thousands, finally with a, a more um, affordable and accessible uh, internet. I got the opportunity to dive way more into um, uh, my research, my ongoing research um, about music from the so-called non-Western world. 
And uh, it took me a while, of course, uh, because the, the, there was a, a, a lack of um, uh, information regarding that, that topic, either at an academic level or uh, an independent level as well. Um, so uh, that was, uh, oh, I can't remember exactly. <laughs> um, I think about 24 years ago, I, yeah, I think so. Um, so, yeah, I guess around 2017, 2000, um, yeah. Oh, no, uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, around uh, um, 1997, oh, or 1999, I can't remember. It doesn't really matter. Um, I uh, studied electroacoustic music in uh, Belgium. And uh, we studied um, her um, history of, um, well, um, a francophone <laughs> European history of electroacoustic music. And so we started with uh, Pierre Schaeffer in 1948. Um, and then we went a bit further with. Uh, um, Stockhausen and so on and so forth, uh, and I thought, mm, well, that that sounds odd to me because uh, there were people before that, like John Cage was before, but there were other other people as well, like Luigi Russolo in Italy, um, and I had heard about an Egyptian composer uh, whose name maybe you know uh, Halim al Dab, and none of them were mentioned in. Uh, uh, in, in this uh, history. And that pushed me to, to look a bit further. And um, in the end, as I said, thanks to the internet, I started to discover much more than what was written in most books. And uh, that triggers more curiosity uh, from my side, and uh, I went on and on with an ongoing research that, that will never stop, where it will stop when I die, I guess, <laughs> but, but that's it. Um, and uh, thanks to the internet, I could access music from non-Western countries much more easily. Um, so, in the early 2000s, you had um, some uh, file sharing softwares. Uh, one of the first ones was the uh, Audio Galaxy, and many people started to jump on them because they, they would use them as a media library. I mean, it's called piracy at some point, it is. Uh, so people would upload and download music. But soon came another software called um, um, SoulSeek. And that software was for me way more interesting because it was a lot dedicated to electronic music and alternative music in general. And I realized pretty quickly that some of the people sharing files there were not uh, Westerners. I met there people from uh, Thailand, people from China, for example, and they had a huge collection of, of music, music from their surroundings, but also Western music. And I remember once that I had a chat with somebody from China who had a huge collection of experimental and industrial music uh, from the West, like Anstutzel and Maybauten and uh, Throbbing Gressel, um, Diamanda Galas, and so on and so forth. And I thought, wow, so that means that this person there in China knows a lot about what the West has been doing. But we don't know at all what the, those people there in China and other countries do. And uh, I had one contact in China back then, um, Yang Jun. Um, I can write his name. Um, who was and is still running um, a label, uh, Sub Jam, basically, um, 
who um, published uh, some of the first punk music in China, but also noise and experimental music. And uh, we had some good chats and uh, we finally managed to, to meet. And on the same uh, peer-to-peer -peer software, uh, had other contacts like uh, people sharing music from Iran, like punk music from Iran, or uh, electronica from um, um, Thailand. Um, so I thought, okay, um, we can hardly access this music. I started to buy and, and, and swap music from, from there. Uh, but it, it wasn't always well distributed or, or the distribution was very poor for this kind of music in, in, in Europe. Um, not that it was planned, it's just that um, well, most people didn't know that this music existed over there. And um, so I thought, okay, the best way for me to start to um, publish more of these compilations and um, perhaps uh, write about this kind of music is to go there as much as I can. Um, so because I had um, a job back then, a part of uh, a music job, I worked in the media library in, in Belgium, which was an amazing place for me also to, to discover uh, all sorts of uh, music. But again, that was uh, not on purpose again, uh, lacking of a so-called alternative music from the non-Western world, so to speak, I could uh, save money and just uh, travel at some point. Um, I did not apply for any grants uh, back then um, for various reasons. I was not especially connected uh, with the art world except this, uh, do, this uh, do-it-yourself world. Um, but I will explain a bit further later uh, my view about grants, using grants or not. And so um, in 2003, I got the opportunity to, to go to Istanbul. Um, and uh, I got the net, basically, to, to see, OK, I thought there must be uh, people in, in Turkey doing this kind of music or having any interest. And, I might try to find a, a gig. So um, in the end, uh, I can't remember how I managed to to find somebody interested and who was organizing and is still organizing um, noise and industrial and experimental music concerts in uh, in Turkey. And I thought, okay, that's the first step. And I stayed about a week in Istanbul and performed there. That was pretty difficult. I must say we've been kicked out from the venue by, by the owner who thought that it was not music and the customers were going away. But it has changed now so far. It's much easier over there. Um, but um, what amazed me is that I performed for uh, maybe 20, 25 people, um, but, but just to me, regarding them, it was noise and break or uh, it was amazing. I mean, you, you would play noise music in London or in Berlin, often you would not get more than 25 people anyway. Um, so to me, it was fine. And uh, But what I find very interesting is that um, a lot of those uh, attendees were also musicians and they wanted to talk with me and share the music, giving me cassettes, giving me uh, CDRs and telling me, nobody comes here. You are one of the first ones to, to play this kind of music here. I, there were people before me for sure. Um, and it was very odd to me because Turkey is not that far. It has always been connected to, to, to Europe, especially um, post-war Europe with all those um, guest workers who came to uh, Berlin and London to work and were in touch with the punk scene, with the industrial scene, with the experimental scene, and who would go back home or go on holiday home, bring back magazines, music that was shared also uh, in some uh, street stalls, selling uh, pirated cassettes. And, and there were people 
um, copying metal or punk or whatever over there. So um, it, it was a bit shocking for me to, to, to hear that. And I thought, wow, okay, that, that, should, that should really change. And um, a year later, in 2004, I got the opportunity to go to Thailand. So again, thanks to uh, SoulSeek, I got in touch with somebody in Thailand. Uh, SoulSeek, in, on SoulSeek, you could, I guess you still can, I don't use it anymore, um, open rooms. And you, ha you had rooms for uh, punk music, a room for... Uh, uh, Iranian music and a room for uh, Thailand. So I wrote there, hey, is there anyone here interested in booking a show for this and that kind of music in Bangkok because I'm coming, blah, blah, blah. And somebody put me in touch with a composer there, uh, Bang, who uh, booked me in an art gallery, uh, who performed as well, um, as well as, as uh, other musicians. And um, I realized that most people who attended the, the concert had never heard this kind of music before, but out of curiosity, they came and, 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 and listened. And um, I, I found it amazing. And Bang, this organizer, told me that if I wanted to, to go to Vietnam, he could put me in touch with people. And six months later, in January 2005, I decided to... Well, I flew <laughs> um, during six months um, to East and Southeast Asia, um, to China, to Vietnam, to Laos, to uh, Singapore, Malaysia, South Korea, uh, Thailand, um, Malaysia, to perform, but also to try to meet as many people and artists as I could to understand what was going on there. Um, and if I could find... Uh, so-called sound art and experimental music and so on. Uh, and of course I did. A lot, really a lot. I brought back 70 records and uh, tapes and CDs um, home. And uh, I published a compilation two years later. Uh, that included artists from Asia, including the Middle East and a bit Africa where I went a bit later. I wanted it to be an archive because I had never found any uh, collection of uh, so-called electronic and experimental music from Asia and Africa. Uh, and I don't think that anyone ever published something like this before. There were a few compilations published throughout the 60s, 70s, perhaps 80s as well, uh, in electroacoustic music, featuring uh, well-known composers such as uh, Bülent Arel um, from uh, Turkey. Um, uh, sorry, uh, Bülent, or uh, Ilan Mimaroglu also from uh, from uh, Turkey. Um, uh, sorry. And uh, or Halim El Dab that was mentioned before, and a few other ones, but it was always big uh, names of composers who studied um, at uh, Princeton University or uh, in, in, in Paris, in France, in the Netherlands, and so on. Um, and to me, it was a very important archive because um, a lot of people. Um, tried to um, discourage me to go in fact telling me you will find nothing there you will lose time you will lose money uh, and i knew it could not be true and you would find uh, or meet uh, composers and so on uh oh yeah i forgot to oh yeah I, i'm not in the general general shot let's see no no sorry i made a mistake excuse me everyone uh so I type again um, Bill and Arrow and Ilan Mimaruyu. Yeah. Um, so um, to me, that was a, an important document with a small note. I wanted to write more, but um, I was young, I was uh, 
in an emergency as well. I wanted to publish it once and for all. Um, and so did I. So this compilation was uh, called Beyond Ignorance and Borders. And I've, ch I've chosen th this title because, uh, um, well, to me, it was ignorance to, to pretend that uh, no one outside of the West was making this kind of music. And uh, the border thing was to me a, a big problem that we've built those borders. Um, and, and the media has built the borders as well. And the media has fed people with uh, propaganda all the time. It was uh, propaganda, propaganda against um, Eastern Europe, um, telling that the Eastern Bloc was only about uh, dictatorship, censorship, everything was forbidden, uh, modern art was uh, censored or restricted, and this kind of music also, blah, 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 which was not exactly true. The world is not black and white. and. Uh, it was exactly the same with um, music or, or art in general from um, Asia, Africa, and uh, Latin America. So all this pushed me to travel more and to document as much as, as I could. Um, unfortunately, not filming because I could not uh, afford to do that uh, back then, but um, taking notes and uh, making interviews and publishing music and uh, now also having radio shows where I, I play music from Latin America, Africa, and Asia, and so on. Um, and I run this label, uh, CIF, um, where I publish a lot of compilations and also albums of artists from Asia and Africa, mostly a bit Latin America and my own works. Um, So um, I've been accumulating um, an insane amount of documents, I must say, and above all, thanks to the internet, um, I've got also books. Uh, I can share a PDF later uh, to you with um, a few um, references. In fact, you just can click on um, on the. Uh, on the links basically if you download the pdf i'm sending it now it's just a few books um about uh, japanese about sound art that includes uh, sound art from uh, china for example or japan and so on uh, of course the list could be much bigger um, but uh, it's just a starting point so to speak uh, it includes also a, a book that you can download for for free um so um yeah that that led me to to uh, you're welcome to to do this um to to dive deeper and deeper and deeper and to try to understand okay why uh is it so unknown this part of uh, history uh why is it not taught in the universities art centers and so on why are they um that were there um, there are no books back then just few articles and so on well it's the same old story it's uh, just uh, um the, the the west has colonized <laughs> a lot uh, and uh, has um, put aside uh, um, a big part of uh, history of uh, non-western artists and composers and whatnot um and we need to, I think, to rewrite or update uh, this uh, history of electroacoustic and sound art and so on and so forth. Um, I think uh, that um, in the 21st century, we can't pretend anymore that we, we can't access this information. Many essays have been written, written uh, especially by people like uh, Bob Gluck in the, in the USA, um, who wrote interviews and essays but uh, about composers in Iran, Egypt, um, Japan, Indonesia, and so on and so forth. Um, you also have a um, for Latin America, uh, Ricardo uh, del Farra, um, who's uh, set up an amazing database for electroacoustic music from Latin America uh, from the 1950s until today with music extracts, uh, with uh, biographies, and so on and so forth. 
Um, so um, during all this time, I decided to uh, set up a, a database also on, on my own, which is a very basic, simple one. I, I, I should work one day with a programmer to make it more uh, searchable and uh, fancy, so to speak. <laughs> um, I started many years ago. Um, and as soon as I put it online, it contained only a, a, a few hundred uh, references back then for Asia and Africa. Um, I got a lot of good responses and people telling me, hey, I, I see this person is missing, this label is missing. So there was an interest. So it pushed me to, to go further and further. Um, so may, maybe you've accessed um, the, the database um, already. I, I can um oops i can quickly uh show it to you sorry i'm going to share the screen um so this is uh, this one um so um so it's just a list sorted out by um countries basically uh, lists of um, artists and labels, composers. Um, so from from my list of Africa and uh, and Asia, but not only dedicated to uh, the academic world. Um, I've always been. Um, I've always been between two worlds: the the um, academia and the so-called do-it-yourself. Um, network, and I always uh, felt com comfortable with this. I think this world is often divided, unfortunately, and there is a cruel lack of communication. And one good example for me is um, uh, in China, for example. Um, at the University of Beijing, there is a department dedicated to Asian studies in electroacoustic music and sound art connected to the Sorbonne in uh, France. And um, they have literally almost no connections with the independent scene in China, which is more vibrant, more active than the academic scene. And they don't speak about them. And I find it very problematic. So I decided that for this database, I should be really more inclusive. And being more inclusive in the end also led me to um, put some uh, notes about uh, women also in this field of sound art, experimental and electronic music uh, in the database. Because um, what first a lot of people told me, uh, when finally uh, I published this database and this music, many people told me, yeah, but there are no women in there especially in some countries like Indonesia or in North Africa, for example. And I say, it's not true. There are some. Sometimes they are a minority, sometimes not. In some countries like Vietnam, for example, I think women are a majority in the field of experimental music and sound art. Um, in Singapore, in China, in Taiwan, there are um, a lot of women active also in this field. Um, so I put a little icon next to... Um, the artist's name or the band's name when it includes at least one woman for uh, all those who are uh, doubting about it or those who do research about uh, um, <clears throat> feminism and uh, women's uh, feminist studies and so on and so forth. So for me, um, sharing is, uh, is, a, is a big part of my uh, practice. Um, not only sharing my music, but sharing... Um, um, other people, uh, music, and, and this ongoing research I'm doing. Um, and um, this leads me back to the grant story and then to the publication um, problems with um, some university press and so on and so forth. So the grants. Um, a long time ago, I never applied for grants because, well, I never thought about this, I was not well connected, and uh, I had enough money to travel on my own, so I could afford to do it. 
of course one cannot travel forever <laughs> like this especially if if, if i spent uh, i've spent i spent i've spent a few times um um three to six months on the road throughout um, uh, africa asia the middle east um and um so sometimes i got the opportunity fortunately to, to get some uh, help through a goethe institute for example here in germany but um even though I, it's it's pretty convenient and I'm, I'm grateful that grants can exist they can be um problematic sometimes um because um if i decide to stay six months in 19 countries across asia i know that for me it's almost impossible to get a grant that that is going to be accepted and, and cover this um so i i don't expect um systematically expect to get a grant and i prefer to remain like uh, this uh, uh, do-it-yourself person sometimes um because uh without any grant I'm, I'm i'm more free i can spend more time to do my research i can travel more and i can fail and i i think um that in in our world it, it's difficult to fail <laughs> I mean, in a capitalist world, you need to succeed. You need to go um, further and further, and uh, you need to justify what you do. You need to, to to justify the fact that you are doing this, and that you got money that you used in a proper way. But sometimes you you cannot succeed. You you might fail for for various reasons. And if I don't get a grant, uh, at least nobody is going to to go mad at me <laughs> because I failed or because I did not, I, 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 I switched the, 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 the topic, for example. Um, this, is one, this is one point. So it gave me more freedom to not have any uh, grant. And also um, I've been in some countries where anyway, um, I could not get any help. Uh, because people would tell me, well, pff, there is nothing here, just forget about it. And uh, I thought, no, it's not working like this with me. I go, and if I meet people, I meet people. And uh, to me, meeting people has always been a very important uh, fact. Uh, and I see it even more now during this uh, never-ending pandemic. So what happens is that um, if you are online all the time and you chat with somebody somewhere on, on a social network or you send emails and you exchange music, you get a Bandcamp link, whatever, fine, it, it's, it's good. It's uh, instant access uh, to an infinite, inform, um, infinite uh, amount of information, which is not always good, but it, it's, it can be very convenient. Uh, but once you turn off your computer, your connection, it's over. And this is what I noticed during this pandemic, that uh, for the very, very few concerts I gave online or some of the talks I gave online, when it's finished, it's finished and it's over. But when you are somewhere physically and you meet people at a gig or in an art gallery, um, you speak, the event is over, but maybe you go have a drink with the person and you develop the conversation and that leads you to um, um, hints, um, more contacts and so on. This is why I like to travel so and meet, physically meet people. And this is what happened many times um, throughout my travels um, everywhere, basically. Um, I decided to make a two month tour um, from north to uh southern africa through uh the east and uh, while on the road a friend of mine told me i've got a friend in zambia do you want to go there uh without this uh, physicality it would have not have happened and this person i met in zambia was not connected to this uh, scene but once i was there i could try to meet people uh, which is uh, very important and people talk and you meet a friend 
uh, by accident and this friend knows somebody somebody who knows and so on and so forth so networking for me is a very very interesting uh thing um it's uh, even uh, essential I, I would say <clears throat> sorry um now uh, i want to speak about um the way i publish and the way uh i think about publications so as you may know um dimitri lafay as annie mentioned it and i published a book a few years ago noise in southeast asia not, uh, not your world music noise in southeast asia we decided to do it because uh, we both uh, have been a lot in southeast asia and we thought that it's almost not documented a tiny bit um, indonesia tiny bit in the philippines but mostly by uh, filipino people so not really reaching um, the west uh, or even uh, japan or china and so on so we decided to make interviews and to write about what we think about this uh, but also stating that we know that we are not from there and that our views might be a bit biased uh, that we we might miss some information and forget some people because yeah we are not locals um, i wrote several essays uh, before and after this as well with and without dimitri and i'm still writing a lot about africa right now um and um my goal is to share as much as i can meaning that each time i can i publish either for free or for a cheap price um that leads me to speak about uh, uh some academic publications um that they are so overpriced that i don't understand the point of publishing them <laughs> because in the end people from the university for from uh, the academia can access them uh and no one else so there are people who publish a book for a few dozens of people and those people often complain about the fact that their, their book doesn't sell well <laughs> yeah well when a book costs one or two hundred euros i understand why it's so, uh, it, it's so difficult to sell it and if you want to share knowledge and if you want to uh, reshape a history of a certain topic like sound art and electroacoustic music to me it's, it's nonsensical to 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 keep all this in this private circle and this is what happens also with the sorbonne for example and the asian studies with um, the 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 conservatory of beijing where these documents are hardly accessible uh so again for me this networking and sharing uh topic is very important uh and it also um helps to to collect more information because we have to know that if we deal with a topic like uh, indonesian experimental music we know that many people in indonesia would never be able to afford to buy a book that costs 100 pounds uh, or even people here anyway uh, and so they, they cannot interact with the writings they cannot give an opinion they cannot update correct if there are mistakes and so on and so forth um uh <laughs> yeah well i see the notes bloomsbury yes i know and uh i i, I know i i published an essay with dimitri on the bloomsbury <laughs> i know so i'm badly guilty as well it was a good opportunity but i know well don't tell me it's like this for example um uh, so this this sharing uh, thing is is extremely um, it's an important topic in my practice. Um, so well, I'm extending. I'm I'm speaking a lot basically. Uh, so yeah, I'm thinking a lot about this research, but it's not the only thing I'm I'm uh, I'm I'm doing. Of course, I'm a composer and musician, but uh, I wanted really to 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 speak a lot about. Um, this practice of mine and this um, me trying to um, update and reshape this history uh, I'm, I'm not going to dive too deep into it we have no time for this uh, today but um, the fact is that there were composers from the 1950s 
in Asia and uh, in Latin America um, and in Eastern Europe and in Africa. I can't really give any date except for Halim al Dab in 1944, uh, and then there were some more later, at least from the 1960s, that were active in the field of uh, sound art and electroacoustic music and sound installations. Um, but they were barely mentioned in the book. It's changing. Uh, but I think what we need is really kicking the um, uh, honest, um, honest net. Uh, some people tell me it's a slow development. I think that it should not be slow. Like, it, it, come on, it's been 60 years, uh, 70 years even. Um, that, that, that has to drastically change. There, there, there must be a radical update of this history and also a radical update of um, um, about how we, we view the, the rest of the world, but also how the rest of the world views uh, the rest of the world. Um, because some people told me that um, it's, a, it's a Western perspective to, to ignore uh, what happened outside of the West, but I would say it's not. Uh, it's maybe human because um, during my travels, I realized that um, when I came from Vietnam to China in 2005, uh, people in China told me, what were you doing in Vietnam? And I told them I was performing noise music with local artists. Oh, we didn't know they were doing this kind of music there. And it was the same with people in uh, in uh, Iran, who didn't know uh, there were people in Iraq doing this kind of music and vice versa and so on. There's a lack of communication. It's improving, drastically improving, thanks again to the internet. Uh, but th that view has to change as well. Um, I realized that a lot of composers and artists and researchers from the non-Western world know about the history that we, we, we are being taught here, but we don't know about their own history. Um, and so for me, it has to change. And this is what I'm trying to do, what I fight for, what I encourage people to do. And I also encourage people from uh, this uh, so-called non-Western world to document themselves and, and, and to write and to publish, um, to show they exist um, and to, 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 to decolonize, basically. Uh, it's, it's, it's very, very important. Um, a very important part of my work. Um, it became so important in the end that sometimes I have no time to, to make music anymore, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, what I will, well, okay. Uh, so um, I would like to have a small break, uh, if you don't mind, so like uh, two minutes or something. And then I will speak a bit about my uh, music practice, uh, what I do and, and how and why I do it and how I integrate also my, my research or parts of my research into uh, this. Okay, great. Do you want to take a short break now and then maybe a short break after you finish? So, or do you want to take five minutes now? We'll take five minutes now and then... Okay. After you finish, maybe a two minute break before we do the Q&A. OK, great. Right. So everyone come back at um, 3.29. OK, hopefully everyone's back in the room. So yeah, feel free to start whenever you're ready. And yeah, maybe, I don't know if you can speak for maybe 20, 25 minutes, and then we'll have a short break and go into the Q&A, that sound okay? Sure, sure, definitely. Amazing. Um, so yeah, after all, uh, all this, uh, <laughs> it's a lot of info at once, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I'm going to, to, to speak about um, my practice in music. Um, so, um, in, in fact, I've been uh, classically trained a, a tiny bit when I was a teenager as a, playing percussions for an orchestra, basically. Um, and as I mentioned before, when I was a teenager, I, I started to, to do this uh, um, so-called experimental music and industrial music. I was a bit uh, reinventing the wheel at some point. Uh, I had 
no knowledge about this. I had just a few cassettes and vinyls and no uh, other, no further references and very little money. So I, I experimented. I had a double deck um, tape player and I started to um, cut the tapes and glue them and do loops and so on but things that had been done already uh, <laughs> decades earlier but i didn't know it um of course I, as i mentioned I, I dived into it so i went further and further into this uh, uh, music world and then i studied electroacoustic music um i was probably one of the last students to to have to practice a bit with real to real tapes there uh, there were computers, of course, but the teacher, um, Annette van der Groen, who is um, also a, a composer from Belgium, Belgium um, uh, asked us as much as possible to also uh, experiment with tapes to, to understand how it works before uh, using the computers. Um, so I'm really happy I grew up uh, during the, the time without internet and uh, with very little access to um, technology. I mean, computers and so on were, were so expensive in, in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, so it, it pushed me to explore um, sound in itself. Um, I've always got a passion for sound. But, but when you are uh, obliged to push boundaries, um, I think you become more and more uh, creative. And one of my issues uh, nowadays is that, uh, well, it's great at some point, you get softwares ready-made with all what you need, all the plugins you want, and for a cheap price or, or for free, depending on what you work with. Um, and everything is set up and uh, here we go and you have these um, sample packs and so on and so forth uh, but i find it a bit too easy <laughs> i always liked as much as possible to create my own sound and if i need a river i go take my bike and go to record the river as much as possible instead of downloading a sound uh, if i need a voice i might do it by myself or ask uh, someone and so on and so forth. What I learned also was to to be invent extremely inventive. <laughs> I wanted I had a sound in mind, and I wanted it. I had to use a lot of imagination to try to mimic um, that sound, and uh, that was. Uh, uh but that is still a very important part of my uh, work but i don't only do uh, sound art um, and so-called experimental music um i have a passion for music so i listen to even though i listen mostly to um, some forms of electronic music and uh, electroacoustic and so on I listen to a lot of other things. I listen to some, not so much, but some punk music, some psychedelic music, some free jazz and free improvised music that I also do um, to um, electronica and so on and so forth. Uh, I want to discover all the time and to um, to get influences from the music world, but from the whole world in, in general. Uh, and and try to understand what I can do with uh, this uh, this information. Um, what can I incorporate in, in my own work? And also, what can I avoid? Um, because um, another issue I have is that we often fall in the trap of doing something that has already uh, been done before. And um, I, Something I find pretty funny is this um, academic electroacoustic world where some composers, or many of them, tend to use um, similar softwares like the GRM tools, for example, and end up uh, composing music that 
that was avant-garde a few decades ago and that became a cliche nowadays. And uh, I find it pretty sad in, in the end, unless it's on purpose, but it's it's not uh, often like this. And I realized that many um, electroacoustic music composer tend to think that electroacoustic music is still a kind of avant-garde, but I think it's not anymore in most cases. Um, now, of course, the question is, um, is it still possible to invent something uh, totally new? Uh, I think it's very difficult because so much has, has been done uh, before. So I don't try to, to, to create something well, I wish I could create something I've never heard before, but I know that as soon as I put out a new piece, somebody might have done some, something similar before me or used a, a similar technique for, for sure. So it's a, it's a challenge for me. Uh, so when I listen to music, it's not only about getting influences, it's also uh, trying to avoid to copy uh, what has been done before, at least for some of my projects, not all of them. Um, in these compositions I do, I often uh, incorporate uh, noises, acoustic elements, um, field recordings. Um, I like mm, I like pure electronic music. Um, I've always been into it, but most of the time. I don't compose um, purely electronic music. I, I really like to incorporate elements taken from my surroundings. And that also means not only the sonic elements, but uh, my experience in life and uh, some uh, political topics as well. I think that uh, especially in the field of electroacoustic music, um, sound art is or might be a bit different. Um, there is a cruel lack of uh, political involvement. Of course, it's my way of seeing things, my perception against the one of other people who don't care about. But I find electroacoustic music often uh, um, deeply abstract, but with very, very few political engagement, uh, which I find a bit sad. It shouldn't be systematic, of course. But uh, why we, we had composers like uh, uh, Ilan Mimarolyu, for example, in Turkey, who, who was, uh, well, who criticized a lot uh, the Vietnam War, for example, and, and racism. Um, he's one of the very few uh, composers from, from that time who um, incorporated um, social political element in his music, and uh, to me, it's it's an important part of my world my work. Sorry, it, it's not uh, systematically uh, included in a text that I might write for a piece. It's sometimes only the title or the place where uh, the composition has been made and um, with uh, a certain um, topic. Um, for example, um, th three years ago, um, I've got the opportunity to perform in uh, Iraqi Kurdistan, uh, thanks to um, Space 21 uh, Festival. Um, I can write it down. Um, that happens in uh, uh, Slemani, the, the cultural capital of uh, Iraqi Kurdistan. And uh, of course, I, I've heard a lot of people tell me, are you crazy to go there? It's war. I say, it's not war. It's war in central Iraq. It's not war in the north of Iraq. And I'm invited there and I want to, to, to meet people there who are interested in sound art and to perform and to share something. And I made a composition with uh, um, partly with um, um, fossils and stones um, I found in the mountains over there and a performance and I published uh, a recomposition of it. Uh, there are no lyrics in, in, in this composition, but um, 
to me it was a statement that this has been recorded um, in this place where many people told me not to go so this has been made possible thanks to people there and um, it's 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 a trace of a, um, a performance that happened in an so-called unusual place um, if if we have a bit of time i would like to play uh, maybe a few of my composition a, a bit uh, um in, in fact, I, I completely forgot to 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 to, to, to take that place <laughs> um um but I'm, I'm going to to play uh another um piece um uh, it's um a piece i composed many years ago i've been offered to to, to make a piece with a gamelan sample uh, of course one can think that gamelan is a bit cliche because everybody knows what gamelan is from indonesia mostly not only but and so on and so forth um, um and uh, some would argue it's a cultural appropriation which i don't think it is <laughs> and uh, and uh, when i compose with um so-called traditional music instruments and uh, classical music non-western classical music instruments i don't try to reappropriate a music genre or uh, a music score uh, a musical atmosphere i want to um, extend uh, my knowledge and extend my experience and maybe build uh, bridges um, so it, it's a it's a piece i made with um, um, percussions and uh, gamelan samples uh, that time i used samples um, Ooh, I can't remember, but a long time ago already. I'm going to, to only play uh, about a minute. I would not consider it as uh, being purely a, a sound art piece. I'm going after that to play another extract, but I'm not going to play the full pieces because we don't really have time for this. Um, so I need to share the sound first. Um, and this one. Yes, I'm okay. <laughs> So um, this is a piece in which I included also field recordings that I made over there. Um, it's not by accident, of course, that I accepted to do this this place. I have a kind of passion for gamelan music, um, but I wanted also to, to 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 give my touch. So I just um, sampled and decomposed uh, the original pieces to recreate something uh, totally new and incorporate. Uh, elements I found or heard um, when I was over there. Uh, 
On, on the other hand, I'm, I'm doing compositions that are completely different where, as I mentioned, I rarely use any um, samples. I used to, it, to do it a, a long time ago when we used samples and so on, when, when it was um, um, maybe a trend at some point. Um, but nowadays, uh, I, I compose a lot with my, my own sounds, instruments, objects. I like to collect objects um, when I travel, whether I travel in Berlin or on the other side of the world, and uh, incorporate them in my music. And I keep them as a memory as well. When I hear uh, the piece, I remember where it has been uh, done, what kind of field recordings I recorded and where I recorded them and why. and uh, and what elements I collected from that place, a stone, a bit of a piece of metal. Um, of course, all this is very um, personal, I must say, and no one knows most of the time um, where those sounds come from. Uh, but because I'm a, a, a sound person, it's my better connection to, to the place. Um, so I'm going to play a, a piece that has been entirely composed in Berlin, on the other hand, um, which is more related to um, something well, that we could call sound art and something we could call um, electroacoustic music, even though it's mostly uh, not electronic, right? it sounds electronic, so it could be music concrete. I don't always care about those um, terms. I, I like to have a a foot in different parts of this uh, sound art world. Uh, so I'm going to uh, play a bit of um, um, this piece now.
And so uh, here we go. Um, uh, what, what, what I, when I compose this kind of music, what, what I do most of the time is improvising, and then I rebuild and add layers and have new ideas and so on. I, I almost never or very rarely have any idea in mind of what I'm going to do. Uh, so when I start to compose, when I start a project, it's it's really extremely rare that I know exactly how the piece should sound like. To me, it's a bit like life. It, it's full of um, random elements and situations that are not under control. So I do record stuff and I then select the parts that I find the more interesting, the parts that, that work together, and I rebuilt something, which is um, the exact um, opposite of what I do live. I enjoy a lot to play live, but the, the studio composition is what, uh, um, in, what I find the most interesting because I can keep everything under control. I do improvise for sure, but then I rebuild something and it leads me somewhere and I can readjust and um, improve and change. Uh, what live, well, I do what I do live and if there is an accident and that I don't like, it's too bad, it has been done, which can be interesting, but I find it very frustrating. Um, this is why I'm, 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 I'm really a, a studio person, even though I play a lot live, basically. Um, uh, so these compositions, as I mentioned, I, I, I do them with whatever I find, whatever I collect, instruments and sounds, and um, th there is no uh, limit for, for me, and I'm not a person who, um, who is a preaching, uh, telling that um, analog electronics is better than digital, better than this, that, that. I don't care. I love sound in, in general and I include whatever I enjoy in, in my music. There is um, absolutely no um, limit at all, um, so to speak. Uh, okay, uh, I guess I should uh, slowly stop, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah, for, for the Q&A. Uh, yeah, well, there is so much to say, but... but uh, we can speak further with the Q and A anyway. Yeah, if you want to play one more track or something, that's you most welcome to. I, I, I could, yeah, I could play um, another uh, one. Um, um, well, th this one, um, it's uh, it's it's one I made at the very beginning of the the pandemic. <laughs> we can't escape speaking about this uh, pandemic. Uh, the thing is that uh, it was a bit. Yeah, odd for me to, to not be able to travel because I travel so much and all of a sudden everything was gone. I came back from Africa uh, very stressed because the borders were closing and I managed to to go away from uh, Eswatini and from uh, South Africa two days before they closed the borders and wondering, oh, what am I going to do now to, to, to make a living? Uh, even though I, I do things on the side like doing masterings and so on, but... Uh, and then, then I thought, okay, now I've got time. I can't travel anymore. Um, I need to finish a lot of projects, and I, I should uh, also do something uh, related to um, to um, my experience now. Um, if I, I made two tracks. There is one I made in Eswatini. So Eswatini is a Swaziland, but Swaziland is not called Swaziland anymore. It's called Eswatini for a few years. Um, I was kind of stuck there. It was in the middle of a tour and, uh, well, there was no tour anymore because of the pandemic. And I was worried, but I thought, okay, I'm here. Let's do fair recordings and let's compose and do something. And uh, I was thinking a lot uh, about the fact that we were a lot of people stuck somewhere and 
wondering what, what's next and uh, maybe panicking for some. And I thought, wow, we all failed. If we had to go to, to another planet now and, and fly in a spacecraft, we all failed because I, 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 after like three days, we uh, locked somewhere, we already go mad and depressed and so on and so forth. <laughs> so, so I'm in a few pieces with this um, topic. Um, and, and one of them is, uh, what is uh, this piece I recorded in Esotini with um, local elements, a lot of field recordings. And I realized that if we had one day to travel into space for long distances, and settle maybe somewhere like Mars or whatever, what people would miss, among many things, is the sound of nature, the sound of a river, the sound of the birds, um, the, 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 the insects and so on and so forth. So uh, I, I used um, those elements to, to build a piece uh, for, for gongs and field recordings, uh, maybe a bit of electronics. Um, so yeah, I'm going to play an extract of this one. Sorry. I can go further in the piece. Am I sharing the sound? I'm not sure. Do I? Yeah, okay, sorry.
uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but it's a very long piece. But I can send you the link later uh, because you can download it for free anyway. Um, meanwhile, I'm sharing the, the database I'm, I'm, I'm doing. So if you want to check, it's uh, freely accessible. And if you want to look a bit further, uh, oh, sorry, I forgot um, everyone here. Um, yeah, that's it. So the idea behind this uh, this place is just that I was stuck there in, in an apartment in the mountains of Eswatini, which is a lovely place, basically, but with a, a pretty uncertain future, uh, not knowing if I would be able to go back to Europe and how I would survive there. And I thought, okay, I have nothing else to do. So let's go in the mountains, record few recordings, the frogs, the toads. The insects, <laughs> I, I make something of it. I try to keep the positive side, basically. Uh, and, and to me, it's a very um, a precious memory because each, each time I hear it, I, I remember the situation. Uh, it has a lot to do with memory, with my, my music and my own memories. And I find it interesting because uh, when I play some concerts, sometimes people... Um, have a narration they, they tell me oh yeah when i listen to your performance i imagine this and that and that and i find it very interesting because it never corresponds to what i have in mind <laughs> and it's nice it's for me uh one more reason why i love music over uh, visual art even though i find visual art interesting as well is that um it, it's um it's opening up your imagination much more than something that is that an image than an image that is fixed whether it is the cinema or or a, a painting it doesn't matter i think it there are some uh, settled limits uh, yeah so to speak mm. that's wonderful Thank you so much, Cedric. That was such a fantastic talk. I think um, Thank you the, too. <laughs> the way of like entering and talking about, I mean, you talked for a long time, but it's such a passionate way. It was very engaging about your kind of journey and um, why you've yeah, chosen to travel kind of endlessly around so many places and collect all the amazing um, knowledge and documents, as you said, that you have. Um, you put it really nicely, kind of updating and reshaping the history of electronic music. Um, so inspiring. Um, right, I know the students have prepared some questions. Um, are we happy to go straight into that? Does anyone need a quick break? Do you, Cedric, do you need a, a short break? Uh, yeah, maybe one minute. Sorry, yeah, maybe one minute. Okay, let's all take one minute and then we'll come back um, for the Q&A. Okay, great. That's good. It gave me a chance to move away from the extremely busy door that I had somehow <laughs> chosen to sit next to. So apologies again for the noise on my side. Um, so I think the people in this week's group were Eleanor, Anya, Alicia and Tom. Um, I don't know if any of you wishes just to start off. Yeah, I can I can start with the first question. Um, let me Hi, just Tom. share my screen. Hello. Hi. Oh, I think uh, we need to enable that. Um, Michael, are you okay, able I'm to gonna... give? Amazing, thank you. Oh, you can do it. Okay. Great. So, is it is it working? Can you see the screen? Yeah, we can see the yeah. screen. Okay, great. Um, also, if anyone has any questions, they can just put them in the in the chat so we can ask them after. So, the first question. Um, how do you think the internet changes the concept of seeing genre and outside of music in music? Um, well, it, it completely changed. I think it opened so many doors. It's very interesting um, because people started to blend uh, genres. I mean, people have always been doing this, but way more with the advancement of the um, instant communication through the net because um, now you can access uh, so much information so much music um, within a fraction of a second um, that um, the process of uh, digesting new music and uh, um, 
composing something new um, from it uh, is, 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 is very quick. Um, and you have more and more people uh, doing intercontinental exchanges as well and collaborations influ influencing each other. And I see uh, more and more examples. Uh, uh, for, for example, there, there is um, um, Slick Back, a composer from uh, Kenya, who um, composed music with um, Haifi, a composer from um, China, from Shanghai. Mm -hmm. um, and I find it interesting that when I, I heard his music first, I thought, oh, that reminds me of some music I know from uh, uh, this label in Shanghai, and then I realized that they were doing music together. So um, th there is no uh, border anymore. It's just uh, you are online and you meet somebody. This person does this kind of music. Uh, the other person does this kind of music, and, and you can blend. Um, while in the past, uh, you had to access some kind of music through your record store or through a a media library and of course they were not having all sorts of music ever while well, now with the internet uh, in theory you can access i suppose 99 percent of the music genres ever published are there so you, you have an instant access to to knowledge and you can digest this and try to do your to make your own version of it so it's fast and also i think the world is going faster and faster we can see that when i was uh, in the 1980s if you would buy a, a record that was published two or three years earlier it, it was just yeah fine it's just hey did you hear the last album of uh, whoever and now when you publish something six months later people say it's old we never say it's mm -hmm. old for a record that was like three years old <laughs> it wasn't old was like a decade you know so everything is going faster and faster nowadays i think okay that was great thank you <laughs> Welcome. Um, thank you so Anya, do you want to yeah yeah sure i can i can read that one can can i you can we hear me yeah Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Yeah. Okay, so second question is, should an artist be defined by a genre? If so, where would you put yourself? Or should, you, should they just be an artist for making music in that area? Well, I think every, everybody has a different answer. Some people, some people like to be defined and, 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 and some people just do one genre, take one direction. I don't. So, um, for me, it's not always important. I give names um, because it's easier for people to understand maybe what I do. I often use the term experimental music because if I use the term electroacoustic music or acousmatic music and so on, many people don't know what it is. If I say experimental, they vaguely know what it is, even though I don't believe in this term, experimental music. So much experiment has been done before. Is there really something like experimental music in the 21st century uh i'm not sure um so usually i say i do alternative electronic music and experimental music and if people want to know more i can say more but i do so many many things that i can't put myself in one box only and i think it should not be mandatory and especially in the 21st century i see more and more people who who go in, in multiple directions. I've met people who do harsh noise and r and I don't know how it's possible, <laughs> but, but I mean, R&B maybe for a living, but they do. So how do you define them? You know, or how would they define themselves as uh, composers or, or musicians? So, um, yeah, I think I cannot really, uh, answer much further this this question. It's a, it's a difficult question, in fact. <laughs> okay, thank you. Welcome. Um, okay, so this yeah, this is kind of leading on to the next section, also about identity. Is identity always present in an artist's work? 
or does some aspect of creativity defy locality and cultural history? Um, so in terms of noise music, do you need to be, does one need to be inspired or can, can it originate in multiple places independently? Mm. That's a good question. <laughs> um, well, it depends on what you mean by identity, but if it's a kind of a local identity, ethnicity, uh, geographical location and so on, not systematically, of course. Um, it's nice that you ask because um, when I published this first uh, compilation, Beyond Ignorance and Borders, in 2007, some people told me, but you published this music, but we don't hear they come from there, like there what meant Vietnam, Algeria, South Africa. My answer was, and I always answer the same. Do you expect a Scottish noise band to play noise with bagpipes? No, you don't. I mean, it can be wonderful. So this identity, especially in an abstract genre like noise music, um, cannot be systematic. If it's there, fair enough, but it doesn't have to be. Um, and it's the same with electroacoustic music or classical music. And we fed each other. We, we, we People were influenced by different music genres, different cultures, and and then it ran back to to another place and so on. Uh, now, of course, you have um, compositions and artists uh, that that you you, you can geographically um, um, point out. I mean, there are some music genres I know where they come from. Like if you speak about, it's not. Um, related to sound art but if you speak about um singeli for example which is a very fast beat music from tanzania uh well you know it's from tanzania because almost no one does it outside of tanzania um but if, if we speak about noise for example uh and as you ask if it can originate in multiple places independently of course it can and not only place but time as well if we speak about Luigi Russolo and his brother Antonio Russolo, who made their version of noise music in between 1913 and 1919, more or less, or in the 20s, maybe still, I can't remember. It's obvious that this noise music doesn't sound like the noise music from the 70s, that doesn't sound like the sound music from now. And also there is a disconnection. It's obvious that most artists who did some noise music um, after them uh, had never heard about their work um, and, and and people now also I mean I can take the the example of uh, Pauline Oliveros she did some noise compositions in the 1950s and I know that some um, noise musicians nowadays have never heard about her and her works so there is this um, um, temporal um, disconnection but also there is a true fact is that uh, because we live in a global world and it's not new it's been at least 500 years uh, even though it was uh, much slower back then and, and it's probably more than 500 years because humans have always been traveling um, some uh, techniques and some forms of art and some ideas have emerged more or less at the same time uh, the fire is an example that emerged in different places throughout um, humanity, um, possibly with no connections. It's uh, the same with um, uh, Dada, that was officially born in Zurich in Switzerland, but there, there was a kind of similar movement in, in New York. It's the same with punk music, that punk in London in 1976, even though there were proto-punk bands uh, in Peru, in Belgium, or wherever uh, before that, but at the same time, you had also some punk music, not called punk music, uh, in the USA. Um, so for noise music, it, it's it's a sure thing that it, it's it's the same. Um, and uh, you have, for example, um, a scene in Indonesia, which is the, to me, the, the biggest noise and experimental scene of of Asia. 
Uh, and you realize that a lot of those noise artists from Indonesia took their influences from uh, the so-called Japanese music and or from the um, US um, noise rock music. So that means that the way they um, uh, dived into um, noise music is a different path than the one taken in um, in Japan and in, 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 in the Americas and, and in Europe, where our influences were probably different. Uh, what most noise artists were not taking their influences from metal and punk music in, in Europe, I would say. Um, and certainly not an, at an extent like what happened in Indonesia later. Um, so um, also to answer your question about inspiration, we are always inspired by something. Nothing is spontaneous. Uh, you, you cannot in, invite something out of the blue. You always, um, you are influenced by anything. Uh, maybe it's not music, it's something else. Uh, it's your life, it's uh, your experience in life, or it's the, the music you grew up with, or the music you hated. Um, but because, again, we live in a global world, we tend to be fed with a lot of similarities, with little differences. Um, so especially nowadays, uh, we might end up um, composing similar uh, pieces and genres because of our surroundings, especially with the internet now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Welcome. Um, thank you. This is the next question. So, yeah. How can we be proactive in challenging global hegemonies music in music and art? Uh, well, you need to shout out loud. <laughs> 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 well, the question is uh, how we, can we be proactive in challenging global no, 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 I, I, in music I, I, and music yeah, yeah, oh okay I thought answer, you hadn't heard sorry <laughs> and my, no, sorry sorry and my answer is this I mean it, it, it's important to, 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 to be heard and to, to, to criticize I mean not everybody's not, not everybody agrees with me but I think we really need to kick a uh, hornet's net and we need to to be loud and it's not only about uh, decolonization it's also uh, uh women in the field of uh music in general and, and the arts and so on um because all documents are there all the proofs have, are there that women have been active that that um and people in uh i don't know egypt or, or uh, lebanon or uh, vietnam have been active uh, but it, it, it's, it's often not uh, well documented, even though it's, it's changing. I always repeat this. Uh, so I think that what is interesting is joining platforms, network, and trying to to be in touch with people also from 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 there and exchange ideas and uh, see what we can do to well to push for a, a change. Uh, I don't know, conservatories and, and universities can be su such dinosaurs sometimes. I mean, they, they, they have the information, but they're so slow to move. You know, I don't understand, for example, um, why it took so many decades to, to document artists um, like Halim al Dab, Bülent Arel, or Ilan Mimarolyu, and, and many others, while they all studied at Princeton University in the 1950s. I mean, Bülent Arel was even an assistant, he was not studying there. So it's not that they were not known. Um, so I think being proactive uh, is just uh, keeping speaking about this and, and digging because we still miss a lot and a lot, a lot has not been documented, I think. Um, so um, when possible, being really in touch with, with the people and, 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 and talking about what they know that we, we don't know, basically. Um, but yeah, it's it's uh, it's a long <laughs> work, and being as independent as possible also is important. I mean, if you can work with institutions, it's amazing, but it's not always easy uh, because some of them have their own agenda. While well, you are free, when you are alone, I mean, I'm an individualistic person at some point, <laughs> even though I love networks, uh, but I've never limited myself. Uh, uh, 
when so many times people told me, don't go there, there is nothing. Don't go there, it's dangerous. Uh, you are losing time. You are losing money. And I never listened to those people. And I was right. That's it. So I do whatever I want. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> okay. um, so uh, the next question, compared to 30 years ago, when you started gathering information about noise scenes in Asia and Africa, the technological methods have greatly improved and should have facilitated the process. How come despite interconnectivity and the internet, is it still possible to create interest about those scenes to a Western audience? Um, yeah, and the second part is part of the problem of one-way communication between Western culture and the rest of the world. Yeah, uh, a part of the problem is this one-way communication uh, in general. Um, why is it still like this after so many years? I don't know. Um, I think some people lack of uh, interest, maybe, or I heard many times also people tell me they never imagined that somebody in, say, um, Palestine would do um, sound art because they think that it's not a stable country and uh, maybe in, in these people's minds it's, it's, a, it's a very conservative society and people have other priorities than this, um, which is of course not entirely true. Um, in, 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 in most part of the world, parts of the world, we, we, we interact w with each other. And some people come to study here or people come to, to study there. And again, there is the internet. Um, so to me, it's a bit, yeah, of an oddity. And, and, and yeah, weird that some people still don't know that it's, it's possible. But it's not only about music. I remember once I had a... Um, um, modern art magazine with uh, modern sculptures and paintings from uh, the Congo and uh, Kenya, Ethiopia and so on. And a friend of mine told me, oh, I didn't know they do this kind of art there. I think, but why not? This person thought that these, these the, the, the people there only do a traditional art. And still nowadays, a lot of people think that people in... Uh, Mali, for example, only do traditional music, which is nonsensical to me. Uh, I mean, they, they have cities, they have universities, they have uh, uh, planes, they have uh, um, access to the internet, not everybody. And even though some people might not have this access or little access to it, that doesn't mean that they cannot be inventive. They all live in the 21st century. Um, and even traditional music is not a fixed uh, genre basically traditional music the so-called traditional music from um 2021 doesn't sound like the one 100 years ago not exactly and doesn't sound like the one 500 years ago that's not possible um but it seems that a, a lot of the western audience is stuck into it but it's not only the western audience i want to insist about this um i've been traveling in in, in a lot of uh, asian countries and a lot of people told me they never imagined that people in in Africa or um, in parts of the Middle East would do this kind of music. Um, uh, yeah, I think also there is a, um, a lot of information um, that is spread on the internet um, comes from very few sources. Uh, like big so mainstream sources, whether it's universities or some media and so on. Um, and there is so much information on the internet that it's an ocean, you know, and I know what, what we, we do here is just uh, some drops in the ocean and then you need to, to dig and it's sometimes very difficult to, to find or it, it, it needs a lot of efforts and some people don't want to, to make any efforts. Uh, yeah. When I started, it took me nights sometimes to you know type keywords the first time i went to to myanmar it's because i was on tour in asia and i thought i need to go to myanmar to see what's going on i knew there was a punk scene but no one 
in, in Southeast Asia could help me. They would tell me there is nothing there. And I told them, I don't believe it, um, even if it's a terrible dictatorship. And I was typing keywords like uh, Myanmar experimental music, uh, Myanmar electroacoustic music, Burma experimental music. No, nothing was working until I typed Yangon experimental music and I got a video and a contact and I wrote the person and I and I went there and I documented this and I published things. So it, it, it needs a lot of efforts that people don't always want to take or have no time. I mean, we cannot do everything either. This is also a fact. We, we, we might have other priorities. Um, thanks so much, Tom and Anya, for your questions and your um, preparation for that. Uh, I don't know how many more questions you have. I'm just aware that there's a couple of questions from the audience. Okay. Um, um, let me see. We've one, two, three, four. Okay, four more questions. So, yeah, we can just go to the audience question. Perhaps? Yeah, yeah, if you don't mind. I think we need to yeah, in terms fine. of time. Um, okay. Do you want to help read out? So there's one from Adnan and there's one from um, Chia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I read for you soon, huh? okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Maybe just read uh, it out in okay. case someone else can't read it. Yeah. If you don't mind. Okay, so from Adnan, um, with many artists from Asia and Africa often living, being away from their homes, what relevance do you think the idea of diaspora musical heritage? and estranged homes have in experimental music or sound art? Um, <laughs> uh, I don't always know. It depends on what kind of diaspora we speak about, I think. Uh, well, I'm part of a diaspora. I'm Greek, Congolese, Belgian, living in Germany. But in the end, I feel more European than anything because I grew up here from the age of two, even though I've been back a lot to to Africa, I never made it back to, to the Congo. And I think it's the case of many people. It also depends on uh, in what kind of environment they grew up. If they, they were in a kind of more or less a closed um, a community from their diaspora or, or not, and what were the their daily lives back then. Um, what is was it mostly Western influence or not? And it also depends on uh, for how many generations we we speak about. Um, honestly, I, I find it a bit problematic. For example, when uh, uh, U.S. citizens uh, of African descent um, put in forefront that they are from Africa and uh, they are Africans doing this kind of music. You have this Afropunk community, for example, and so on. And I often disagree with them. I tell them, listen, it's been like, how many generations you are living in the US? You know nothing about Africa, basically. You've never been there. You've got no contacts there, nothing. You are a US citizen. Of course, I understand that as a black or brown person or whatever in, in North America, you may be ostracized, for example, and your culture might be uh, slightly different than the so-called white culture in the USA and so on, or Canada. I agree with this, um, but I, I hardly consider them as, as being a diaspora, because if we go back in time like this, then so many Italians and Polish people live in in Belgium, and so many um, and Turks live in, in Germany for a shorter time anyway. So it's a bit, it's, it's a bit difficult. Um, uh, of course, there are those who are permanently in touch with um, with their families uh, living abroad or, 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 or traveling now and then or, or rediscovering the country and who have a strong connection um, and who, who might bring uh, uh, interesting elements and uh, differences in, in the way they, they, they see uh, sound art and they, they conceive and um, and play sound art, um, but I think it depends on the individuals. It's I, th I think we cannot um, generalize uh, on, on that topic. It's uh, it also really depends on uh, if if we speak about somebody who just moved uh, one or ten years ago 
um, somewhere, not necessarily to the West. Mm -hmm. uh, I know uh, people who moved to, to, to Asia or throughout African countries, people from Somalia living in Uganda and so on. Um, or, or, or is this person was this person born there, and and and, and the parents migrated? You know, it, it's a it's a very uh, hard topic. I would say, yeah, I can't say more. Sorry. That's great. Thanks, Cedric. And Anya, would you mind reading out um, Chia's question? No, I, I don't mind. Thank you. Um, Chia asked. What studio headphone, monitor speakers, and field recorder do you use? What do you do when you struggle in mixing? And what was the first place you decided to do mastering for leaving? <laughs> All right. Well, my headphones are the, the classical uh, Sennheiser um, um, HD25-1. <laughs> I mean, they're very classic. Uh, um, then the, the recorder, I, I use a Zoom H7, is that one, I think, which I, I would not recommend. Honestly, it depends on your budget, because when I will have a bit more money, yeah, I, I, I will consider to, to, to buy something else. I mean, Zoom is convenient because it's uh, it's portable, it's uh, it's not expensive, but the preamps are very noisy compared to some other ones. So I tend to use the Zoom also with some external preamps and external mics. Uh, so if you don't have a lot, a, a big budget, um, some of the Zoom field recorders are, are very nice and they have interesting options. Uh, like you can record twice what you are doing. Uh, one at the volume you decide and one at the lower volume. So if it saturates uh, at, at one of uh, at the maximum volume, you know you have a backup copy. Um, but I'm not promoting them. I mean, the, the best is just to, to go to a... A forum or a Facebook group or whatever, and, and ask for information. Um, um, so the, the first place I decided to make mastering for a living, well, it came with the time. Um, I had a job back then in Belgium, and uh, I started to do mastering uh, jobs because I, I, I like I liked it. I like sound, and I like to to mix. And and some people started to to ask me. I advertised a bit about this, and some people started to know me and have been asking uh, but it's not my main income because I have no time to to only do masterings it's not possible uh, I have other passions as, as you noticed so uh, of course it's, it's nice to pay my bills to, to have masterings to do but it's, it's never going to be my main job because I love to compose I love to travel and sometimes I'm, I have no time to do it and that's it but I like to kind of uh, improve something when it's possible or clean. I, I love cleaning, uh, making, making uh, restoring jobs also. So it's a, another thing I love to do. Yeah, that's it. Okay, all right, we better wrap up because we've already um, gone over the time. And thank you so much, Cedric, for thank your you wonderful too. answers. Thank you to the audience and to our Q&A group, Tom and Anya. I don't know if there's other people joining in in the background there, but very nice questions. Um, yeah, thanks so much for sharing us, uh, sharing with us your work. And I think just, I guess, carving out how much work there is to do to get over all of our own ignorances and biases. Um, when we are moving in these scenes of sound art and so-called experimental music. So I think I think there's a lot of work to do and hopefully all the young people in the room are going to take up the mantle and help with the exploration that you've done so much work already in. And uh, for the students, I'm going to try and get Cedric's book into the UAL library somehow. Um, I don't know where it's available to, to buy, but I will, uh, I'll email you, Cedric, and see if there's yeah, a way of um, I, purchasing I mean it for the library. Yeah, I need to dig my archives because uh, it's sold down, but I might have one or two copies left just in case. Um, but yeah, write to me and uh, yeah. otherwise just feel free to download people. It's not a problem. I mean, it's okay. free, it's there. Right? So. <laughs> but you are, you know, as we were talking about these libraries, they do have money to, to buy books, so they should support um, the projects that have been done. <laughs> Okay, everyone, thanks so much for your attention. Thank you again so much, Cedric. Um, I'll see you all next week um, when our guest is um, Nick Knack, uh, Nicole Redmond, 
Um, the Q&A group is is a big one. I'm not sure if you're all sticking with this, but it's Jake, Maria, Rose, Ebony, Eleanor, Bohang, Ben, Thorn, Fikrat, Hanifa, um, Juice, and Alicia. So a big group next week. Um, fantastic. Take care, everyone, and thanks again, Cedric. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.